Hi guys, this is Rob Kelly and this is another PowerPoint video from a presentation I did at conference 2016, the Spring Conference. And this particular presentation is really about the relationship between desire for control, perceived control and learned helplessness. That's desire for control, perceived control and learned helplessness. So desire for control, then, as we know, is a personality trait reflecting the extent to which individuals are generally motivated to control events in their lives. Kind of in our parlance, it's how much control you want, how much control you want to, to gain, how much control you want over situations. Perceived control is how much control you think you have, how predictable you believe your experiences are. And perceived control is kind of a combination of locus of control or space and your sense of competency. So how much control you want is desire for control. How much you think you have is perceived control. And then learn helplessness is explained as the maladaptive passivity shown by animals and humans following experience with uncontrollable events. They have little or no control over events of concern or important events in their lives. So it's this passivity. Stuff happens, there's stuff going on, and they've just learnt to be completely passive and just let this shit happen to them, and there's nothing they can do about it, or they believe there's nothing they can do about it. So the main, or certainly the early researchers into uh, learned helplessness was actually Martin Seligman. And Seligman or Seligman's team developed um, an experiment where they basically pinned down or held down dogs and subjected them to random electric shocks. That's not the picture you're seeing at the moment, a different picture. Or imagine that box you can see there without the barrier in the middle, okay, without the bridge in the middle. So these dogs were held down or, or, or trapped or tied into a box somehow and they were just given random electric shocks. Unpredictable, not following a particular pattern, and um, quite unpleasant random shocks. And what happened was that uh, the dogs very, very quickly stopped bothering to jump around, stopped bothering to try and get away, and just sit there and, and take the shocks and don't do anything about it. What they then did was put those dogs in the box you can see in front of you, where only one side of the box is getting shocked. There's a small barrier in the middle, let's call it a barrier box, a small barrier in the middle. And if they were able just to get over that low barrier and get to the other side, they'd stop the shocks. However, the dogs that had gone through the learned helplessness training, shall we call it, that is the ones given the random shocks, didn't even bother trying to get over the barrier in the middle. It'd be really simple for them to escape, but they didn't even try. That's learned helplessness. Now, in contrast, dogs that hadn't suffered the previous training, the previous day's uncontrollable electric shocks, this is their, their control group of dogs, found it easy to escape. So if you took a random dog now that hadn't been through that training, in inverted commas, of being given the random shocks, which happened to be the day before, stick them in the left-hand side of this box, in the A side, and give an electric shock, they just quickly jump to the other side very sensibly. At the same time, animals that have been immunised, if you like, against the debilitating effects of uncontrollability by first experiencing controllable events. During immunisation, the animal learns that the events and experiences can be controlled. And this positive expectation is sustained during the uncontrollable events. Now what that means is you've got another group of dogs that were trained with, for example, um, predictable electric shocks, controllable electric shocks. These dogs the day before were actually trained that if they suffered a shock, they could get away from it. Put those dogs into the box previously, and those dogs again will jump from left to right, will go from A to B, because they've learnt that they can escape, or they've learnt the thinking that, you know, there may be a way of getting out of this. They've got that critical thinking, that critical thinking that we've talked about before. 
these dogs are thinking, there may be a way out of this. I'll try and get out of it. And they get out of it. So dogs that have had no training at all and aren't particularly helpless would look to find a way out of it. Dogs that had been trained to sustain difficult times, sustain electric shocks, find it easier to get out. It's only the dogs that have been trained to be learned to have this learned helpless trait that find it very difficult to even think about, is there a way out? And they just sit there and keep taking the shocks. Furthermore, even when the poor animals with learned helplessness were subjected to the barrier shock box, they could still be trained out of it by forcibly showing them several times that escape is possible. So even with the poor dogs that had been through the learned helplessness training the day before, i.e. the random shocks, and they're put in this box here, and those that would just sit there on the left-hand side, in the A side, and keep getting those shocks after shocks after shocks, you could train, in inverted commas, those dogs out of their helplessness by grabbing them by the scruff of the neck and dragging them over the centre box, over the, uh, over the bridge in the middle of the room there. Drag them over into side B. You have to do it four or five times until they suddenly realise, oh my God, I can get away, I can get away, and they snap out of their helplessness. So even then, you can still train the dogs out of their learned helplessness. Berger and Arkin, in 1980, found that people high in the desire for control exhibited more helplessness behaviour and reported higher levels of depression following a learned helplessness manipulation than did subjects low in desire.